last night uh, we celebrated uh, Holy Thursday, and it's a commemoration of uh, the Last Supper where Jesus instituted uh, the Eucharist. And to fulfill also the promise of Jesus that he wants to be with us until the end of time, through the Eucharist, he instituted the priesthood. Okay? And, so, you know, the other role of a priest is to preach, to teach uh, the, the people, the faithful, you know, to, to, to be able to give food that would nourish their soul. That's one of the, the, the role of the priest. And it's a wonderful privilege, really, to be able to preach the good news, to proclaim the gospel, and be able to inspire the hearts of many people. It's a wonderful privilege. I, I, I love preaching. I'm passionate about it. Uh, but also, with, with, but it go, with, with privilege, it has to do also with responsibility. We need to be responsible in how we preach and how we practice what we preach. And, and it's hard. It's hard to do that. Uh, in, in, in James chapter 3, verse 1, it says there, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, for you know that we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. Okay? So for those who are teaching, we will be judged with greater strictness. And in, 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 in Luke, chapter 11, uh, Luke chapter 12, it says also, everyone to whom much is given of him much will be required and of him to whom men commit much they will demand the more okay so uh again you know uh the lord will judge us more strictly because we're teaching and in fact like jesus in 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 in, in the gospel he would rebuke the the teachers of the law it says it says here in luke chapter 11 verse 46 it says there woe to you teachers of the law for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the, the burdens with one of your fingers. And for me, I, I, I'm very guilty with this. You know, when, whenever I would preach about forgiveness, I would find myself struggling to forgive for those who have offended me. Yeah. When I would preach about uh, detaching ourselves from things of this world, I find myself attached with so many things. When I would preach about um, uh, you know, w w when, when I would teach about like uh, uh, embracing the suffering in, in this world, you know, uniting ourselves with, with Christ, and yet I find myself running away from suffering. So I I'm very guilty with this. You know, uh, uh, I'm sure my brother priest here could, could really relate. You know, sometimes there's, there's, there's a discrepancy between what we preach and what we practice in our life. That's why for me, I, I pray to the Lord, I don't want to preach something that I do not practice in my life. So I strive to practice whatever I preach. And I know I, I, I will not be able to do it perfectly, but I, I know as long as I'm striving, that's good enough with the Lord. Okay? But with the Lord, that was not a problem with Him. He's the greatest te teacher of all time, and yet He practiced what He preached. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 28, it says there, his, Jesus taught his disciples and said, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. Let's see, let's see how Jesus was able to practice that in his life. You know? Jesus suffered so much and was crucified on a cross, and people would think that it was done by the Jews. No, it's not just by the Jews, but by all of us who commit sin. Okay? As I've said, you know, it, it, it's our pride that made Jesus wear the crown of thorns. It was the, our sins of the flesh that Jesus undergo that scourging at the pillar. It was the weight of our sin that Jesus was carrying this heavy cross. And the three nails that nailed Jesus on the cross, it was our disobedience, our selfishness, and our spiritual slot, spiritual laziness. But it was love 
that brought Jesus to the cross. It was love that kept him on the cross. In, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And let's look at the, the, the seven last words of Jesus. Uh, I'm not going to go through all. But the very first words that he, that he said was a prayer to God, to his Father. What was his, what was his first words on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus was making excuses for all of us so that God will forgive all of us. What was the second word? That Jesus said, you know, this is a, a conversation between the thief and, the, and, and Jesus. The thief, the, the, there was a thief who repented. And, 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 and the repentant thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me whenever, when, when you go to your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to the thief? Je Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. This thief, all his life, he stole, he did a lot of bad things, and at the last moment, he repented. And at the last moment of his life, he was doing what, what he was good in life. He was able to steal heaven. Okay? And he was the first saint who went to heaven. And that's also for all of us. You know, maybe for, for you, 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 you've been struggling with sin all your life. But the Lord is asking you, is inviting you to repent. And whenever you repent and believe in Him, He promises you eternal life with Him in heaven. So what's the other? So, so it, it, it's as if that that's not enough. You know, he, he, he was crucified, He suffered so much, and yet He wants to give the greatest gift to all of us. And what's that greatest gift? His mother. Jesus on the cross said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And what did he say to the disciples, which is John representing all of us? Son, behold your mother. He gave us this greatest gift of his mother to all of us so that we will never be orphaned in our life, so that his mother will always be there interceding for us and loving us. What great love. What great love. Despite the suffering that he experienced, he's still giving us this greatest gift of his mother. And on the cross, he performed the last miracle. In the first miracle, if you remember, it, it, it's in, in, in the Gospel of John, when he miraculously changed the water into wine. In this last miracle on the cross, he's performing his last miracle. And what is that? He's now changing the wine to become his blood. And why does he need to do that? You know, he needs to change the water into wine, so, uh, the, 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 the wine into to, to, to his blood, so that he'll be able to shed his blood for all of us, to cleanse us from our sin to redeem us, you know, from, 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 from slavery. And, you know, we, 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 we talk about the, the, the coronavirus a lot uh, this, this past few months, and, and, and this, this virus has become a pandemic. But there's a much more pandemic, a, a virus that is much worse than coronavirus, and that is our sin. And I was like reflecting, what's the, the, what's the parallel between sin and the coronavirus? There's several uh, uh, parallel, and I could think of three things that are parallel. One, sin is infectious. If you sin, you could lead others to sin also. Okay, you know, especially for those who are in authority, priests, bishops, parents, teachers, government officials, we could easily lead people astray. One of the sayings of Saint John uh, Marie Vianney. When I read that, I was scared. You know what he wrote? He said there, a priest goes to heaven or goes to hell and a thousand, 
a thousand people behind him. When I read that, I got scared. I thought if I go to hell, I'll go by myself. No. I, I will be bringing a lot of people to hell also. That's why for me, the great, my greatest desire is to go to heaven and to become a saint so that I will be able to bring a lot of people to heaven too. That's my greatest desire, to be in heaven, to become a saint. Although I also realize that I'm a great sinner. Now, I don't know how God will perform that miracle of changing a great sinner like me to a great saint. I don't know. But one thing I do believe and I know is that nothing is impossible with the Lord. He could change a great sinner to become a great saint. The second parallel that I could think of is that sin isolates, right? Right now, we're in isolation. We have to quarantine ourselves. And that's what sin does. Whenever we sin, we offend God. We separate ourselves from God. Whenever we sin against our neighbor, we separate ourselves from them. It isolates us. The third, the third uh, parallel that I could think of is that COVID-19, you know, as you know, the coronavirus, it could kill. And many people have, have died already. Sin could lead us to spiritual death. And it's much worse than COVID-19. Okay? Because with sin, if you die in sin, you could be in eternal damnation. You could be eternally separated from God. Whereas, you know, when you die with COVID-19, if you die in a state of grace, you'll go to heaven. So the Lord wanting to, wanted to, is wanting to change the wine into his blood, the last miracle that he did on earth, in order to shed it for us, so in order to provide a vaccine to the sin virus that all of us are experiencing. It's, an, it's a pandemic. It's a pandemic. It, it, it did, right now, COVID-19 has just affected more than 1 million people. Sin affected more than 7 billion people. And if we're so vigilant in eradicating coronavirus, how much more should we be vigilant in eradicating sin in our life, in our society, in our country? We need to do that. We need to repent from our sin. Imagine yourself as a COVID-19 patient. You're in an ICU, critical condition. The doctor said, you know, there's no hope. You're gonna die soon. Okay. And this doctor will be there, you know, looking after you day in and day out. But something happened. Something happened. You started to get better. Okay? You got out of the hospital. You know, you, you, you went back to your normal life with your family, with your friends. And later on, you found out that the doctor who treated you died of coronavirus. How would you, how, how, how would you, how, how, how would you feel knowing that the doctor who treated you day in and day out, contracted the disease so that you will get well, but in your case, he died. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus is not just the doctor. Jesus is not just the healer. He's also the cure. He has to die in order to give us this cure, his blood as a vaccine to this corona, this, this sin virus that we're all infected with. If there's one truth that I want you to remember today, one truth, three words, and this truth is Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you personally, which means that even if you are the only person in this world, he would die for you. His love 
is unconditional. His love is eternal. Personal, eternal, unconditional. That's his love for you. And how do we respond? How do we respond to that love? Okay. On the cross, one of the last words of Jesus is, I thirst. I thirst. And what did the soldier did? The soldier got a sponge, dipped it in a sour wine, which is like vinegar, and put it in the mouth of Jesus. And that's how we treated Jesus. We returned his love by, by what? That vinegar, that sour wine, represents our indifference, our ingratitude, and also our lukewarmness. We were not able to satisfy the thirst of Jesus. How do we, how do we quench the thirst of Jesus? You know, he's not thirsting for water. No. Jesus is thirsting for you, for your soul. That's why when we repent from our sin and love him in return, it quenches his thirst. And not just our soul. You know, the more soul that we'll be able to bring to Jesus, the more that it will quench his thirst. So Jesus, on the cross, he preached. He preached there. And he practiced what he preached. In John chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus said to his disciples, he was teaching them, Greater love has no man that, than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus did that. In fact, he did not just die for his friends. He died for his enemies. He needed to die so that he'll be able to shed that blood to be the vaccine, you know, to, 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 to be that cure of this sin epidemic, sin pandemic, sin virus that we have in our life in order to heal us, in order, in order so that we will be able to live. How do we respond to that love? After this homily, we'll just, uh, you know, zo zoom the camera to the cross and just imagine yourself, really you're there at the foot of the cross and just meditate on the truth that Jesus loves you. How are you going to respond to that? 